So I'm going to do the same thing as the previous speaker, talk about uh, depression and its recognition, and then finish by talking a little bit about treatment. Uh, so there was a National Institute of Health consensus conference a few years ago in the US, and so I'm showing you the conclusion before the talk, and that basically late life depression is a serious public health concern. It's not a normal fact of aging, actually, most older people are content and they are happier on average than younger people, including in long-term care. But this being said, there is a substantial proportion of older patients who suffer from uh, uh, clinically significant depression, and I'll show you more specifically the data for long-term care. One reason it's important, even if you don't care about your brain and depression, is because it clearly alters the risk and the course of general medical condition, by the way, including heart disease. It's associated with significant and treatable disability and mortality. And the good news is that it actually can be reliably diagnosed and treated. I mean, for geriatric psychiatrists, they view it as a very easy condition to diagnose and to treat, and we are always puzzled why does it seem to be so complex to some of our colleagues. In terms of the prevalence data, if you look at depressive symptom on what's on your left and major depressive disorder what's on your right, mm. you can see that in the community, actually most people are free of depressive symptom and very few meet the full syndromal criteria for a major depression. When you move to clinical setting, primary care office, it's 10% who would meet criteria for late life depression. When you, talk, you look at an inpatient unit, like uh, some of the one where the other speaker work, you would find about one in six patients. When you move to a nursing home, it's about 25. The 25 is kind of a mixture. It may be up to 40% during the first year, and I'll show you that half of those people die. Of the people who survive, they usually their depression go away, and it may be 10 to 15% for the people who live on average three, four more years, for the one who don't die during the first year. Now, that association between depression and aging in the medical setting is easily explained by the fact that depression is specifically associated with a large number of medical illness. And if you look at this slide, on the left in white, you have depression community sample in two very large studies conducted in the US in the 80s and the 90s. And depending on how you define and you look for case, in this large epidemiologic study, it was three to eight percent of community dwelling patients. The blue bar shows study conducted in specific clinical population. You can see, for instance, in the middle, in people who have heart disease, 16 percent. On your right, you have neuropsychiatric condition like Parkinson, post-stroke, MS, Huntington. You could have a bar like that for Alzheimer's disease. You find that in those conditions, it's about 10 to 25 percent. So. Older people are more likely to have diabetes and arthritis and heart disease and neuropsychiatric illness. Those patients with those di the diagnoses are seen in medical setting like the long-term care home, and that's explained the much higher prevalence of depression in clinical setting as opposed to the community. Some people wonder, well, what are the specific mechanisms linking those diseases, those medical disorders to depression? And, there are a variety of mechanisms that have been hypothesized. And for instance, in post-stroke depression or depression associated with Alzheimer's disease, we have some autopsy data and neuroimaging data showing direct disruption of neurotransmitter or neural circuit causing directly the depression. Then you have conditions like depression following surgery or hip fracture, and the hypothesis there is through stress or disability. And then you have depression associated with something happening in the body of somebody else. Your spouse died, nothing has happened in your body. You can have the exact same depression in terms of symptom that you would see in post-stroke, where the stroke drilled a hole in your own brain, which sometimes is puzzling to people. And there, the hypothesis is through a psychosocial stress model. The good news is, in terms of treatment, it doesn't matter. It's again puzzling to people. Psychotherapy work as well as medication for post-stroke depression or for bereavement-related depression. You would believe that when it's psychological, you need psychotherapy. When it's physical, you need medication. Rather, my study have not shown superiority of one form of intervention over the other based on the cause of the depression. 
So I've already mentioned why it's important to diagnose and treat depression, dysfunction, suffering, physical symptoms, disability, cognitive impairment, utilization of healthcare resource, medical mortality, and suicide. A little bit echoing uh, the presentation on, on heart failure where you could have the same thing probably except for suicide. A few slides illustrating this. Similarly, you know, you saw the slide for heart failure where people go to the hospital and they get better but don't get back to where they are. In terms of cognitive impairment, as a rule, you're going to find cognitive impairment in older people in long-term care who are depressed. The myth is that once you treat the depression, the cognitive impairment goes away. That's one study, for instance, I was involved with showing on your left, the impaired people remain impaired. Very few are cognitively intact after treatment of the depression. And the cognitively intact patient with depression, at one year follow-up, actually 30% of, of them are impaired. So depression is often, a pro, in very old people, a prodrome or associated with the early stage of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia. There is a new term of vascular depression, which is associated, obviously, with vascular dementia. That's a nursing home slide, a famous study published in JAMA in 1991, looking cross-sectionally at an entire long-term care home. Seven, 18 percent of people met criteria for major depression, and then they were followed for one year, and you can see that over one year, almost half of those people with depression died when they were compared to people who did meet criteria with major depression, including those with depressive symptoms, and there was only about, only about 20 percent of deaths when every factor that the author could think about were controlled for. Having a depression in a nursing home increased by about 60 percent, it's a risk factor of 1.6, of dying during the next year. Now, what's interesting is, does the treatment of depression decrease mortality? Not necessarily, that's a, but that's an other lecture. Suicide is one consequence and one way people die from depression, even though most people, older people in the long-term care with depression will die from medical condition. But there is a, a, a passive refusal of care in long-term care, which probably is a form of passive suicide that contributes to mortality from those other conditions. When one of your residents is depressed, discouraged, no longer motivated, refused to get up and go to the dining room to eat, that person has a good chance of dying during the next year. Now, there are a lot of debate about assisted suicide and end-of-life care, and in the context of depression, really tend to be counterproductive and deprive people from opportunities to be treated and to improve their quality of life. And, and even though there is a role for end-of-life care, it's probably not a good uh, patient population to think about. By the way, that's a study we published in JAMA a few years ago showing that actually an intervention that was in primary care outpatient, but you can reduce suicidal ideation in older people by treating depression. And, you know, in yellow, you have the intervention, you have the control group that didn't receive the intervention to treat depression. They were still treated under usual care by their GPs. In red, you have the people who receive a more structured intervention with a combination of a, a nurse and a physician. Now, depression in long-term care is often miss, and that's because other conditions confuse the diagnosis. The patient is losing weight because of their medical condition. They are not sleeping because of the chronic pain, they have lost interest because of the stroke, and people kind of discount the symptom of depression because they are fatigued, because they don't sleep, and, and they don't see the depression anymore. There is an inclusive method of diagnosis. If you see the symptom, you calm them. If the syndrome is there, you diagnose the depression, and you need to do this regardless of the comorbid medical illness. And people have shown that when you define your population this way, you find a population that tend to be responsive to treatment. Older people tend to deny when you ask them if they are sad or depressed, so you have to base your diagnosis more on behavioral observation of lack of interest. Even in the nursing home, the patient who used to get up and to go to the dining room and interact with other residents or the patient that used to enjoy the visit from the family now doesn't seem to engage or the favorite TV show now doesn't want to look at those. Those are the evidence of anhedonia or lack of pleasure, lack of interest. That's going to be a better symptom to look for depression in those older long-term care residents. 
There are other clues for the diagnosis in your setting. Complaint of pain, headache, fatigue, insomnia, vague GI symptom, vague uh, musculoskeletal symptom, multiple diffuse symptom, weight loss. Those patients are uh, some of them. Th those symptoms, agitation, screaming, uh, help seeking behavior, those can be symptoms of depression. Specific population after cabbage, after MI, after stroke, after hip fracture, all people who are there for rehab and don't seem to recover or, not, or to engage in rehab, more likely to suffer from depression. Apathy, withdrawal, isolation, I, uh, agitation, failure to thrive, treatment refusal, those are clues at least to think about dep depression in those patients. Switching gear once you have recognized the depression based on the presence of the syndrome, you know, lack of pleasure, problem with sleep, problem with appetite, low energy, anxiety, death wish, uh, those, when you see that syndrome and you have diagnosed your depression, then come the phase of treatment. And the good news is actually there are some very good data, multiple control trials, including in the very old and the very frail, including in long-term care, showing that's actually a treatable medical condition. And that's probably, of the, all the conditions you're dealing with, one for the treatment of which can be associated with the most rapid and dramatic difference in level of function and quality of life. Depression deprives you of your any quality of life. To remove the depression, you're not going necessarily to be a 20-year-old again, but you can re-engage in activity and function and it markedly improve the quality of life. There is the idea of, does it work in all, all that's a study we published comparing that are in people who are in their 70s, 80s, early 90s with what I would call the young old in their uh, early 60s or the mid old in their early 70s. And you can see that there was absolutely no difference. They were all treated the same way. In this study, combination of psychotherapy and medication, no difference in trajectory of recovery of depression. So the modalities are pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, ECT. I'm going to say a few words about pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy. The good news is, again, there have been enough studies, 62 placebo control st trial, meta-analysis published a few years in the American Journal of Psychiatry, showing effect size that are comparable to what you obtain with uh, uh, morphine for acute pain. So antidepressant work in relieving symptoms of depression. And <clears throat> in this study, it didn't matter the, 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 the class of antidepressants.